Okay. okay. So okay. let's 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 get started here. Um, so first of all, a couple of acknowledge acknowledgements. So um, to be honest, I just took this presentation that I gave when about uh, three weeks ago at a conference in San Diego, and it was a workshop on GPU computing. And this was this this talk was getting started with GPU computing. So basically, I lifted that, and this is this talk today. And I organized it with three other colleagues. A professor from Berkeley, uh, Professor Suresh from ME, and a professor from uh, what used, he used to be at Michigan Tech, now he's in Milwaukee. Uh, I want to give credit to Professor, uh, professor Wen Mi Hu from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. A lot of the slides that I'm using here came out of uh, his uh, presentations. I also want to acknowledge NVIDIA Corporation, they, they supported us with hardware on a couple of occasions. I'm going to talk about that more uh, later. And I want to also acknowledge the help that I received from my students from Hamad and from Toby. Hamad is right there, and he's one of my, my students. Um, and I'm very grateful for, for their help. Um, financial support. Uh, uh, for work that is related to GPU computing came from NSF, NVIDIA, BAE, uh, and Argo National Lab. So uh, how, how is this talk structured? It's not going to be 60 minutes on this topic and so on, because we only have one hour, correct? Roughly. Roughly. Okay, so I'm going to pretty much cut, short at some point, cut it short at some point, because this part of, the, the, uh, of my talk is going to be about GPU computing and like getting started with, but then I want to take 10 or 15 minutes to talk about research that I've been doing with GPU computing. So for the first part of the talk where I'm talking about just general concepts, first of all, I'm going to talk about hard computing, why and why now, and then some, some uh, aspects of GPU programming. And I'm going to talk about the execution configuration, about the memory layout uh, in GPU computing, uh, how you uh, gauge the resource utilization, how much of the hardware potential you take advantage of, and probably a little bit about IDE support. And some I'll close with some comments on GPU computing. Uh, so let's get started here with uh, the need for parallel computing. Um, I think that right now there's a change of tide. Um, people are moving from sequential computing to parallel computing. Uh, and uh, it's not that something that we necessarily like engineers, like mechanical engineers, have control over, but it's something that was pushed upon us by the by the hardware industry. Uh, if you if you want to do sequential computing, we pretty much pretty much exhausted the the the, the potential of this computational model, and uh, at the minimum there are three walls that that uh, prevent uh, any meaningful uh, advancements in this area uh, as far as. In improving speed is concerned. So there is the memory wall, there's an instruction level parallelism wall, and there is a power wall. And I, I listed here, there's, these come out of an article that this individual from Microsoft uh, uh, put together, and the link is there. By the way, I'm going to have this online, and also the research talk is going to be online. In, in case you want to lift some slides out of this, you'll be more than uh, welcome to do so. Um, so when it comes to the memory wall, there's a growing disparity between the, the speed of the, of the uh, CPU core and the speed at which uh, data is available for number crunching. Uh, and as Cray, Samuel Cray said back in the day, you can build a fast CPU. The, the idea is to build a fast system. It's not like only the core, how fast is capable of crunching numbers, but how can you feed it, keep it uh, keep it, you know, uh, at all times uh, loading with data so that it is not uh, starving uh, and sitting there idle, idling in, in, in uh, just waiting for, for new data to, to arrive. Um, if you look at uh, the, the, the rate at which the CPU speed improved uh, from 86 to 2000 is 55 percent uh, annually, while the, the memory rate improved at 10 percent. So. If this number indicates anything, is that this gap between the uh, speed at which you can crunch numbers and the speed at which data can be made available to you, this gap is only growing uh, wider. Uh, there are some attempts for damage control here. There's a strong push for 
larger caches, or uh, you know, recently there is a resurgence in this uh, hypertrading technology. It was there for a while and then it disappeared, and now it came back. And the idea is that you have one physical core, and through this hypertrading technology, it creates, if you want, like a shadow, a clone of it, and it's a virtual second core, so that they, that that uh, the computation is 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 handled more. Uh, effectively, and I'm going to talk about this because this idea, uh, slightly pitched slightly differently, uh, shows up in GPU computing, and it's one of the key factors that make GPU computing so uh, so powerful. Uh, now, moving on from the memory wall to the power uh, wall. Uh, you guys know, uh, some of you here are nuclear engineers, is that right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a trend there, and at some point, uh, as the dimension uh, of the transistor gets smaller and smaller, there is power that gets dissipated. And it turns out that it, 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 the amount of power is kind of like uh, proportional with the, with the square of the frequency. So uh, at some point per unit area, you you dissipate the, uh, an amount of energy pretty much like a nuclear reactor. So unless you go through some heroic uh, measures of cooling this thing down, uh, you are basically melting down the, the, the chip. Um, and uh, if you look back at how people uh, reduce the simulation time of their software almost entirely we serve this clock increased clock uh, wave so to speak because uh, over the last two decades the clock speed increased by a factor of 4000 but if you look back of, at what happened over the last two and a half to three years the clock rates they kind of like you know got stuck at 2.5, 3.5 gigahertz. It's in that in that range, and probably the next the next uh, uh, the next design of Intel, I think it's called Sandy Beach or something like that, is going to be probably close to 4 gigahertz. But it's nothing spectacular. Probably is going to be up a little, going up a little bit, but you know, no, it'll be. Oh, actually, it says here Sandy Bridge. Okay, it's 4 4.0 gigahertz. So, <coughs> you know, the solution has to come from somewhere else, and Fortunately enough, uh, you know, a law is a law, like Newton law. It holds forever. And I don't know if this law is going to hold forever, but the nice thing about Moore's law, you know, if you look back at what this guy said, and uh, uh, he said it back in 1965, he said that uh, about 18 months or so, you can double the number of transistors that you can squeeze on the unit area in such a way that it makes sense from an economical standpoint. So it's not like something that someone cooks up in a, uh, in a lab and it's very expensive. It's something that you can sell to the masses and make a profit. And that's, that's the, the, the very nice thing. Um, what this suggests is that, okay, you will not be able to, to crank up the, the, the clock rate, but what you can do at least, you can have more transistors on the same unit area, which means that basically you can have more chips on the same die. So it's clear that you cannot increase the frequency, but you can go in this other direction where you increase the number of, of cores on one chip. So that's why I told you at the beginning of this talk that it's not something that we, you know, all of a sudden people started to think about this and develop algorithms and such. It's just that the industry is pushing you in that in that direction. Um, yeah, here, you know, it, this looks like 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 dollar bills, but it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's not that. But probably that's a rich man anyway. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, this is out of a, a talk that this individual Paul Peterson gave in March 2005, and it's like four years now. But this was uh, how he. Uh, envisioned the evolution at Intel from dual core to multi-core 
to, uh, the multi-core in the sense that it had something like 10, 16, 32 cores. And then it was a merging of this concept of 